Lord Jesus, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Amen. You got Brother Keys and, and James Hughes. Both of these are incredible men of the word. Amen. Incredible men of the word. And you are going to be blessed with some of the best. Amen. Praise God. But for this morning, you got me. So let's just have church. What do you say? There is a chapter in the Bible that is extremely inspiring. And it's the 11th chapter of Hebrews that supplies us with a brief history of many of the main characters of the Old Testament. The 11th chapter of Hebrews is often referred to as the Hall of Faith. In order to get into the Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11, there were two qualifications. Qualification number one was that you had to face hardship. You didn't get into Hebrews 11 on roller skates. You had to face hardship. The second qualification for getting into Hebrews 11 was you had to overcome hardship. Joseph was one of the heroes, heroes listed in Hebrews 11. He was written about in the Old Testament and then he made it to Hebrews 11. He had received personal promise from God. I believe it's worth our attention to notice that even though Joseph had received a personal promise from God, he was not excluded from problems. Even though God had given him personal promises that someday he was going to be a great man and others were going to bow to him. Although God had promised him greatness, it did not exclude him from real problems. He experienced rejection from his family. He was born into wealth. He was accustomed to servants all around him, taking care of his needs. But yet, he found himself a slave. He did his best as a slave. He made the man who was his master to prosper. And yet, in spite of all of his efforts to do the best that he could as a slave, he ended up in prison. Jesus tells us in John chapter 16 and verse 33 that these things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. There is no way, ladies and gentlemen, that you are going to get through life without challenges. There is no way that you're going to get through this life without pressure. That's what the word tribulation means. It means pressure, anguish, burden, trouble, agitation, disturbance. No one gets through life without it. Amen. The one who knows all things declared that if you're going to have, you are going to have tribulation. And since Jesus said that you're going to have troubles, that you're going to have challenges, then you can expect challenges. Amen. I'm going somewhere, so just ride with me for a minute. Since Jesus said that you're going to have troubles and challenges, then don't be shocked when troubles and challenges come. I'm surprised at how surprised people are when trouble comes their way. They want to know, why me, God? What have I done wrong? But Jesus himself said, there is no way that you're going to get through life without trouble coming your way. You're not smart enough to get through life without trouble. You are not spiritual enough to get through life without trouble. You're not special enough to stay out of trouble. Trouble is coming. Amen. Jesus is talking to his disciples in Luke 17. And he said, then said he unto his disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. 
But woe to him through whom they come. The Greek word for offenses is scandalon. Scandalon is the trigger stick on a trap. Every trap has a trigger stick that the animal touches and the door shuts behind him. Every one of them has something that the animal touches and when he touches that, he is trapped because each trap has a scandal on that triggers the trap. And Jesus warned us that scandal ons are coming. Snares are coming. There is going to be opportunity, sir, that will come into your life that is going to present you with an opportunity to be discouraged. Things are going to enter into your life that are going to present you with the opportunity to question why. There are going to be things coming to your life that will be a scandal on, that will present you with the opportunity to be trapped in anger or despair or in bitterness. You're going to be presented with those things that it's up to you whether you're going to take the bait or whether you're going to refuse the bait. Because you can be sure that the opportunities are going to come your way to be bitter. You can be sure that opportunities are going to come your way for you to have despair and to question God's will and his purpose for your life. Joseph was listed in Hebrews 11. But we don't find Joseph in Hebrews 11 because he had problems because everyone has problems Joseph is listed in Hebrews 11 because he endured problems Joseph is in Hebrews 11 because he passed through problems Joseph is in Hebrews 11 because he overcame the problems that he was presented with. David had received promises from God, the great promises of being a king. He had oil poured on his head. He felt the anointing of God on his life. But in spite of him being anointed king, it did not exclude him from problems. It did not exclude him from real problems. The king of the nation tried to kill him with a javelin, Saul. The king of the nation got his army together and chased him around Israel for 14 years after the anointing was poured upon his head. He lived the life of a fugitive for 14 years. And when things seemed to be better, He was now the king of the nation. He was now sitting on the throne and the promises had now come to pass and he was king. It was in that situation that he had one of his boys rape one of his daughters. Then he had another one of the sons kill the son who had raped his daughter. So in spite of the promises of God in his life, he had pain, he had hardship, he had adversity. But in spite of the pain, the hardship, and the adversity that David experienced, we don't know David as the man of adversity, but we know David as a man who wrote Psalms. We know him as a man that worshiped God in spite of his pain. He is not listed in Hebrews 11 because of his pain. He's not listed in Hebrews 11 because of his adversity. He's listed there because he was an overcomer. He's listed there because he went through his trouble. He went through his problems. He overcame the pain that was in his life. In the book of Revelation, we find seven churches. Each one of those churches called out people. Called out people of God. Churches of God. Churches that had been filled with the Holy Ghost. Baptized in Jesus' name. These are churches. Yet they had problems. The 
church in Ephesus. There were people in that church who posed as apostles. The majority of the church had lost their love for God. They were facing things that required much patience. This is a list of the problems that they had to deal with. Smyrna, their problem was tribulation, poverty, and imprisonment. Some of the people in Smyrna were being used of Satan to create division in that church. Pergamos, they dwelt in Satan's seat. It was an evil city. Some of those people had been murdered. Some of those people had left the truth. Some of those people had been sacrificed to idols. And in the list of each of the seven churches... Each of them had their own challenges. And each of, the, each of them were struggling with their own set of problems. But they all received the same message. That if you will overcome the problems that you're dealing with. I've got promises for you. Great things will happen for you. If you'll just overcome. Each of them had a different set of problems and they weren't measured by the problems of the other church. But the message was the same. You overcome the problem that you're going through and I'll use you. You overcome what you're going through and I'll work with you. I will bless you. You just have to overcome. An important verse in the Bible that Every one of us needs to commit to memory. Is Proverbs chapter 24. Verse number 16. It says for a just man falleth seven times. And riseth up again. Whew. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. A man is not righteous. A man is not just just because he never fails or he never falls. A man is judged righteous because when he falls, when he falls, he will get up again. He rises again. That means that he has fallen before but he has gotten up before. And in this problem, this falling, he's making up his mind, I'm just going to get up again. I'm not going to stay down. I'm going to keep walking. I'm going to keep on serving God. Hear me when I tell you today, there's no condemnation in falling. The only condemnation is not getting back up when you fall. God knows that you're made out of dirt. God knows you're not perfect. He just says, get up, get up. Get up. He's not looking for people who are flawless. He's not looking for people who are unblemished. He's not looking for people who are faultless. God is looking for people that will get back up. He's looking for people that will dust themselves off. He's looking for people that will continue. He's looking for people that will overcome. John wrote things concerning the end time. Revelation 12 and 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. 
There is no way that you are going to overcome Satan without the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ washes sins away. The blood of Christ washes your slate clean. And whenever you sin, you need to repent. If you've been baptized in Jesus' name, the blood of Jesus washes all of your sins away. They are blotted out and they are gone. The blood of Jesus is applied to your life at baptism the big thing to God it's not that you have been baptized in his name and filled with the Holy Ghost by evidence of speaking with tongues that's the way you are born that's the way you are saved but what God is looking for is overcomers. He likes overcomers. He likes people who know how to get back up. And so when you sin, after you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, after you've been baptized in Jesus' name, and the blood of Jesus is applied to your life. So now, what do you do when you fall? You repent. You don't have to get rebaptized because the blood has already been applied to your life. The blood just wipes the sled, takes that away. And when you repent of a white lie, the blood washes that away. If you commit murder, you repent and the blood washes that away because you overcome by the blood of the Lamb. But I'm here to tell you that the blood of the Lamb isn't enough because you see there is no way that you can overcome Satan without a made up mind because God's gift to you is the Holy Ghost God's gift to you is baptism in Jesus name but your gift to God is overcoming your gift to God is getting back up. Your gift to God is never quitting. And so God expects you to pour forth the effort to get up. God expects you to put for the effort to live out your own experience. He's expecting you to produce your own victory. We overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb, but also by the word of your own testimony, by the word of your own experience, by the word of your own lifestyle, that you just keep getting up. And it's because of your experience you've got a story to tell. Oh my God, I fell, but God was merciful. God helped me. God continued to love me, and I got up, and I'm still living for God. I made a mistake, but I got up some kind of way, and I'm still standing. That's how you, ladies and gentlemen, overcome Satan. You let Satan know you can give me your best punch, but I'm going to get up again and live for God I'm going to serve him some more I'm not stopping whatever you throw at me I'm going to get back up and serve God you overcome the world by your testimony you can't have a testimony without a test Job experienced real trials. He had ten children, and all of the ten of them were killed in one storm. His servants were all killed, except for the messengers. His livestock were stolen. That's the same as losing his job, because that was his income. His health was broken. And added to all of that, losing his kids, losing his servant, losing his income, losing his health, he couldn't find God. He tells us in 23 of Job, verse number 8, he says, Behold, I go forward. He's not there. 
and backward, but I, I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. We've all been there. But he didn't stop. He said, I can't find God. I look frontwards and I look backwards. And I look left and I look right. And I can't find God. None of this is making any sense. It appears to me that God has left me alone in this loss of my ten children. It appears to me that God has left me alone in the loss of my job. It appears to me that God has left me alone in my broken health. But look how he says it in verse 10. He says, but he knoweth the way that I take. I don't know where he is. But he knows where I am. And he goes on to say, And when he hath tried me, hear it, I shall, come on somebody say shall, I shall come forth as gold. Job was already planning his future. He's in the middle of the trial. This is not something afterward. He's in the middle of it. His kids just died. He has just lost his job. He was still in the loss of his health. And his present is a mess. His present is a pain, is painful. His present is horrible. He's faced with a scandal on. He's faced with an opportunity to be caught in a trap. He's faced with the opportunity to become bitter, to become angry, and turn against God. But his future, as far as he could see, he's going through a horrible situation right now with no explanation from God. He's going through a situation right now and it seems that God is nowhere to be found. But he has made up in his mind, my future is bright. I'm going to get up from here. The trial is going to come to an end. I am going to be a better man. I am going to come forth as gold. When you and I go through a trial... We decide what kind of response we are going to have when we go through it. You decide whether you're going to panic. You decide whether you're going to whine to everybody because of the hardship that you're going through. You decide whether you just wish you could leave and get out of here. Or are you the one who searches for solutions and decides to come forth as pure gold? That's your decision, ma'am. That's your choice, sir. We overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb, but we also overcome Satan with a made-up mind. I'm going to get up. I'm going to do, I'm going to be better. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to come forth as pure gold. That's your choice. You don't get to decide what you go through, but you get to decide how you're going to go through it. See, John gives us a glimpse of heaven. This is a beautiful part about this message. John 21, verse number 1. He says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacles of God is with men. 
and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things have passed away verse 5 and he that sat upon the throne said behold I make all things new and he said unto me write these words uh, words are true and faithful and he said unto me it is done. I'm Alpha Omega the beginning the end I'll give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely but look at verse 7 and he that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. <laughs> Heaven's a wonderful place. There will be no more tears in heaven, no heartache in heaven. There'll be no pain in heaven. When you get to heaven, you're not going to be surrounded by perfect people. When you get to heaven, you're not going to be surrounded by flawless people. You are going to be surrounded by overcoming coming people you're going to be surrounded by people just like you people who have cried people who have suffered people who have felt pain but kept on serving God they kept on living for God you've cried in your past and you'll cry in your future but make up in your mind today I'm gonna serve God The greatest thing about serving God is not feeling the Holy Ghost. The greatest thing about serving God is making up your mind. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stay down. I'm going to serve God regardless of what I have to endure. These are people that had their minds made up. It didn't matter what happened. It didn't matter what didn't happen. It didn't matter what hardship they faced. They were overcomers. The people in heaven are going to be just like you. People who struggled and got up again. And got up again. And got up again. Somebody ought to be rejoicing about now that yes, I can make heaven. Those that overcome are the people that are going to be in heaven. Revelation 7 and 13 says, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto them, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation. Hang on. Our mind's wheeling. It did not say the great tribulation. It just says they came out of great tribulation. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Who are these that are in heaven? Who are these that are in white robes? These are people who have endured tribulation. They didn't just skate through life with no trouble. They didn't just go through life talking in tongues and in the glory cloud all of the time. These are people that came out of. Came out of. Are you hearing me? Out of. They went into and they came out of tribulation. 
God wants to surround himself with people who not just talk in tongues, not with just people who have been baptized in his name because anybody can receive the Holy Ghost. Anybody can have their sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. That's the gift from God. But your gift to God is to get up again and then get up again and then Get up another time. Just endure it and go through it. That's the kind of people that God says I want in my glory land. (sighs) Hebrews 4. Verse 15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he didn't trip the scandal on, yet without sin. So since our high priest went through trials, every trial like we have, yet he didn't skip trip the scandal on, He says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Whatever you deal with, whatever you face, Jesus Christ has already dealt with that. He's already gone through that. He was tried in all points just like you are. He knows what it feels like to be rejected. He knows what it feels like to be lied on. He knows what it's like to be disappointed in people. He knows what it's like to have suffered. So because he knows what it feels like to go through adversity, We can come boldly. I'm not talking about with your shoulders back and your head back and you swagger in to the throne like you're something, but you can come in with confidence knowing that the God that you're going to talk to, the God that you're dealing with, the God that you're repenting to, he already knows what you've been through. He knows how you feel and you're going to get a fair shake with this God. because he knows what you've already endured he understands the pain he understands the problems and he will give you grace to help in time of need he'll give you the strength to go through whatever it is that you're going through my God I'm preaching to somebody right here we would like to be helicoptered out but how will we know if we can overcome if he helicoptered us out of every problem that we encountered he wants to see us go through it Because he wants overcomers in heaven. He wants people who get up in heaven. He wants people who know how to go through trouble and still say, God is real. God is true. God is right. And I will love him. I will serve him. No matter what I go through, if he delivered you from every encounter, how would he know that you were the kind of man or woman that he wants in heaven? Those that are in heaven... The ones we have read about today, they were overcomers, not just tongue talkers, not just Jesus' name baptized people. These are people that after they received the Holy Ghost, after they were baptized in Jesus' name, after they had the snot beat out of them, they got up again. And they got up again. And they got up again. When you read the 11th chapter of Hebrews, I'm not far from being done. Another 30, 40 minutes. 
I'm as hungry as you are, so just hold on to your false teeth. We'll get there. When you read the 11th chapter of Hebrews, there is one man there that kind of bothers me. He's listed in Hebrews 11, verse 32. It says David, Samuel, and the prophets. That's a pretty good lineup. But there's another guy in there that is listed in that same verse with David, Samuel, and the prophets, and his name is Samson. Now, you are going to be hard-pressed to find a victory in Samson's life. Well, what about the time that he picked up the gates and set them on top of the hill? Let's talk about that. Why did he pick up the gates in the first place? It's because he had spent the night with a harlot and they locked him in. Well, what about the 300 foxes? Well, what? He was mad. The Philistine girlfriend's dad upset him, and he had nothing to do with delivering Israel. He was mad. He was going to retaliate. He had been called of God to deliver Israel. He was the 12th judge of Israel. All of the great things that you see that Samson did, none of them was for the purpose of delivering Israel. It's going to get good right here. All of them were for selfish reasons. They were, protect, they were to protect his own hide, to vent his own anger. There was nothing great that he ever did, and yet there he is in Hebrews 11. In verse 32, listed with David, who did great things, Samuel, who did great things, and the prophets, so at some point, he finally got it right. And he stands there between those two posts, and he talks to God. He had probably been talking to God while he was going around and around like a mule grinding up grain. He's been talking to God. He's become humble. We, we don't hear from him. We don't have any report of him while he's grinding it out. We don't know how long that he grinded it out. It must have been long enough for some of his hair to start growing out again because he was growing in that dark place. I preached that on Sunday night at our home church, that he was growing in that dark place. Oh, my God. I wish I could help somebody right here. I don't have time because i got to get out of here. But I wish I could help you to understand that I don't care how dark it is you're going through right now. You can grow and you are growing whether you see it or not. And so he came to the party. They brought him to make a show of him and he talked to God. He said, God, would you give me strength just one more time? And by saying that, he's admitting the strength wasn't in him. He's admitting that he doesn't have his own strength and he couldn't do what needed to be done in his own power. God, I need your help just one more time. I don't know what kind of conversation him and God had when he got to glory after he won that great victory. But I think it was God saying, well, Samson, you struggled, but you finally got it right, didn't you, buddy? You struggled and you struggled and you struggled. And here we are. You got up and you got up and you got up. You blew it many times. You blew it over and over. But you finally got up. And that's the kind of people I want coming to my heaven. Because who people who got up. People that know how to go through stuff. People who have failed and fallen, but didn't let that define who they are or what they are. I like people around me that mess up, but they don't let that mess up define them. They just get up, and they keep serving God, and they keep living for God. Ephesians 6. Verse 13 says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to withstand in the evil day 
having done all to stand. Stand. Whenever you go through the evil day and through that hard day, go through the scandal on day, when you've done all that you know how to do, when the dust is all settled and you're just standing there, maybe you're not jumping around and having a victory march. You may simply be standing there with the dust all around you. I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. Your knees and elbows are bloody and your head all bunged up, but you're standing. I'm not laying there anymore. I'm not going to stay down. I'm going to stand. I may not be pretty, but I'm standing. I may not be something great to look at, but I'm standing. I'm serving God. I'm not going away. I refuse to give up. Yes, I made a mistake. Yes, I went through some trouble. Yes, I went through some obstacles, but I I'm still standing. I'm talking the dust is not even settled yet. But I'm not going to lay there. I'm going to get back up. And if that's your attitude, if that's the way you think, if that's the way you live your life, then don't let the enemy beat you up because you've fallen. Because the falling doesn't disqualify you. It's the failing to get back up that disqualifies you. That right there was worth your admission to church. And if you just get up, you're qualified. You may be wobbling and reeling, but you're up. My God, I feel like I'm preaching to somebody right here. Uh, you may be wobbling, wobbling and reeling, but you're up. I'm standing. I refuse to lay down. I refuse to give up. I refuse to stop coming to church. I refuse to quit praying. I refuse to quit doing the things I know's right. I'm just not going to quit. I'm going to get back up. Let me help somebody right here. When we fall, usually you don't fall for a wide variety of sins. Everybody has two or three major issues in your life that you battle with all of your life. Now, you don't have to look at me all sanctimonious and like you're sanctified, glorified, holy. I'm talking to you. And if you don't want anybody to know, just look straight ahead at me and nobody will know that I just bonked you on the head. They will go on to thinking you're perfect. But you don't commit every sin in the book. But there's two or three, th two or three things that you struggle with. And Satan will tell you, because you keep battling with those same issues in your life, how long are you going to struggle with this? Here you are 50 years old and you ought to be past this by now. You do realize that he's the one presenting you with the scandal on. He's the one giving you the opportunity to fall. Then he'll say, seems to me by now you should have this whip. Seems to me by now you should be over this. What's wrong with you anyway? How long do you think God is going to forgive you? How many times do you think God is going to forgive you for the same mess up? God doesn't even want you in his presence anymore. Let's go back to the book of Job. Satan was in the presence of God, talking to God. Then we read in Revelation where Satan is before God every day accusing you. So let me ask you a question. 
if the most evil, filthy, despicable devil in all eternity and time, the worst, it doesn't get any worse than Satan, if he can get into the presence of God, I think you can get into the presence of God. I just spoke into somebody's life right there. Because it's been a while, you've struggled with the same thing. Oh, you struggle with an issue. You struggle with a circumstance. And you're wondering, God, do you even love me anymore? Do you even care? Do you even want to bless me anymore? God sent me here today to tell you that, yes, he does. You're his child. You're his child. And he wants you in his presence. His spirit is in you. His blood is over you. You carry his name. He wants you in his presence. Somebody ought to shout yes. You know, whenever we read, I really am quitting. He's not there just to make it sound good. I, I really am quitting. Whenever we read about the prodigal son, it's not really a story about the son. This is a story about the father. Jesus was giving us a good idea of how God will respond when a prodigal comes back. That story was to let you know what God will do whenever you fall, whenever you mess up, whenever you blow it, whenever you rise up and you start toward him. He's not going to make you walk the whole trip home. When he sees you starting toward him, when he sees you a long way off, the Bible says the father started running toward the son. He didn't make him come all the way up and grove along the porch, but he ran to him. The fatted calf was already ready. The robe was ready. The ring was ready. And when the boy got up and came back home the father was there to meet him because he loves people who won't quit he loves people who will get up again and again and again don't you let the devil lie to you don't you let him beat you down that's his trick he's messed up and he wants to destroy you you've got to do is repent and cover yourself in the blood and then get up and be victorious one more time. Just get back up. You still have value. You still have worth. Don't let the enemy convince you otherwise. Just get up. Stand to your feet. Don't you let the devil convince you. You say, well, Pastor, I, I've been told that I, I don't have any worth or I have no value. I just said, don't you let the devil tell you that. Because anybody that will tell you is the voice of the devil. Anybody that will tell you you don't have worth and you don't have value is the voice of the devil. They may look like your mother-in-law, but they're not. They're the voice. I'm teasing. Tim tells me you're the best mother-in-law in the world. I'm just teasing. I don't want that to run my message. But I don't care who they are. If they come to you and say, you're such a mess up, you don't have any value. You've made such horrible mistakes, you have no worth. You hear this preacher this morning, I've come, if there's, you don't remember anything else I say, you remember this. 
God still see value in you when nobody else does. God still sees your worth when nobody else can see it. God still sees your possibilities when everyone else has given up on you. I just came to tell you, don't lay down and quit. Just because you're going through a struggle, just because you've made a mistake, just because it's a perpetual mistake, God has sent me here to tell you, get back up because that's what qualifies you for heaven is to get back up. Come on, shoot your hands in the air. Lift your voice to the Lord. It's time to pray. Come on, it's time to pray in this room. Anybody feel like you'd like to pray? This front is open.